So there's this meme in historical studies that America is the new Rome. The YouTuber What If Altist just made a pretty lengthy video about this. There's some good things in that video and some things that don't really make much sense. So let's analyze his claims and the claim more broadly that America is the new Rome. And if it turns out this video isn't, as the great historian E.P. Thompson put it, Geschichten Sessionslauf, then like and subscribe. Just from the start, I'll outline my main argument. This theory doesn't really make much sense. Yes, America is number one in the world. It's a world empire whose cultural and political influence is truly global, just like Rome was the big kahuna in the Mediterranean. What if Althist points out some other reasons why America and Rome are similar? And I agree with all of them. We can certainly draw plenty of parallels. And doing so is fun. Pointing out connections and parallels across ages and places is cool, but we really shouldn't take it too far. What if Altist goes deeper than just comparisons? He argues that There are clear cycles of history, and one of the strongest and strangest parallels out there is that between the Romans and Americans. These two empires' histories match in very palpable ways. So the claim is, in particular, that America is not only similar to Rome, but it is the new Rome, going through a similar historical path as part of a multi-millennia long civilizational cycle. He agrees that there's some significant differences, but those are the flimsy superstructure to the fundamental base of this cycle. First, I don't buy that there's a cyclical nature to history. Societies rise, shrink, rise again, and except for a few horrible cases, they never truly completely fall. They just change shape. Rome had major setbacks throughout its existence. It peaked multiple times and it never really fell. It just changed labels and evolved. History is continuation, not cycle. We'll get more into that later though. Alright, so now that we have my main point out of the way, we'll trace through the What If Altist video and separate the wheat from the chaff. So he starts the video by making the claim that civilizations go through a 2,500 year cycle. He mentions uh, some other smaller cycles, but he doesn't really base his argument on those, so we'll just ignore them. As he says, Oswald Spengler developed the idea of the civilizational cycle, showing how civilizations often have life cycles around 2,500 years. First, just to get this out of the way, Oswald Spangler isn't a very respected historian today. Of course, he was in his time, which is late 19th and early 20th century Germany. Spangler, like many other scholars in his period and place, saw liberalism and rationality as going too far and wanted to return to a spiritual and mythical past. While the guy didn't really like the Nazis that much, he did vote for Hitler, so keep that in mind. Anyways, Spangler's most famous work is The Decline of the West, which speaks of the metaphysical soul of civilizations and a coming plague of dictators, Caesars, which were manifestations of the people's dislike for materialism and rationalism, more or less. We'll get into more detail on why Spangler is kind of crazy in a little bit. The reason I'm putting this all out is because what if Althist says himself that Spangler forms the backbone, the spinal cord of this video. Alright, so next, what if Althist overviews the basic rules of these cycles of civilization. That a thousand years after their foundation, they reach their greatest philosophical depth, and then 300 years later they're ruled by some hegemonic empire, then face trouble with charismatic dictators. Here's what he says. Meanwhile, Western civilization, which I talk about in this video, was founded around 700 AD, reached the height of its philosophic development in the 1700s, 1,000 years later, and today in the 21st century, 300 years later, is run by a superpower republic with massive social problems that unified Western civilization. You can trace a very similar time scale for almost every civilization that it's uncanny. This really doesn't make much sense. There's no reason why Western civilization would be founded in 700 AD. This claim is rooted in Spangler, who says that it is only after 780 that Western civilization makes great intellectual decisions. Beforehand, by his book, there is no such thing as Western civilization, only a Western culture. Now, Spangler and What If Altist are talking about the Germanic peoples of Northern Europe, because Spangler does not count Rome as being part of Western civilization, but classical civilization. Really, that's just moving the goalposts. The people of medieval Europe, Germans and Italians and Greeks, were a continuation of Rome. The most important religious institution was the Roman Catholic Church, and the most important empires were the Holy Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. They conceived of themselves as continuations of the Roman Empire just as we do today in America and Europe. That's why this video exists in the first place. We base our philosophy today, how we determine logic, meaning, justice, and so on, 
on that of ancient Greece and classical Rome. These philosophical conceptions are important to life in general and to Spangler and Wedefault Hist, forming the basis of their arguments, but they overlook the connection between today and Rome. But it's not just that. The way society was materially structured in the Middle Ages had its roots in Rome. Feudalism comes from Roman plantations. Over time, that structure evolved and changed to the structures that we have today, just as feudalism was an evolution and a change from the Roman social system. So Western civilization didn't manifest in Western Europe around 780. It is an evolution and a continuation of ancient Greece and classical Rome. This cycle theory doesn't make much sense if that fact is acknowledged. The parallels, they're fun, but the cycle theory doesn't make much sense. Okay, moving on. Next, what if Althist talks about a counter theory which says that the civilizations of certain regions go through unique cycles which are unique and different from any civilizational structure as a whole. He says, Why this is the case, I'm really not sure. Maybe the culture, geography, or genetics of certain continents predestine them towards differing historical trajectories. Now, I want to point out the phrase genetics of certain continents doesn't make any sense. The way societies take form and change over thousands of years does not have connection to any deterministic genetic trait. I'll be charitable on this one and assume he's not talking about people's genetics, but taking at face value such a claim reeks of social Darwinism. Next, what if Althist introduces his other major source for the video, Omri de Rancourt's book, The Coming Caesars. Don't get deceived by this cover though, the book was written in 1957 by a French nobleman. As to be expected, Reincourt sees himself as the dodo, with European culture soon to be surpassed by American culture, just like Rome absorbed and surpassed Greece. So that's the main perspective he brings to his book, Ameriphobia. Here's what What If Altist says next. To reach the point of the Roman Republic and the modern U.S., we need to see the cultural context they came from. In both the cases of Western Europe and the Greek Peninsula, there was a previous advanced civilization, the Minoans or the Romans. Barbarians from the north came down, destroyed said civilization, founding a barbarian kingdom and its remnants, that being Mycenae and the Frankish Empire. After this followed a heroic age which had many myths of heroic deeds like those of Roland, King Arthur, Siegfried and the like in the west, or Hercules the Trojan War or Jason and the Argonauts in Greece. However, that empire fell apart quickly after further barbarian invasions from the north, those being the Dorians or Vikings. And again, so it's fun to draw parallels, but this is obviously a gross oversimplification of what actually happened in history. It's only through those oversimplifications that a cycle can even be imagined. You need to ignore all the detail and minutia to draw these vague parallels, and then you give those parallels outsized power. Sure, let's say the Dorians destroyed Mycenaean Greece, which we don't really know for sure. The Vikings didn't destroy the Frankish kingdom though, they just harassed it for a while before being absorbed. The Frankish kingdom stayed around and that's where France comes from today. So we can see that the differences between ages and places are often more important than the similarities. It would be interesting to ask how, for example, the Frankish kingdom survived but Mycenae and Greece did not, but that question can't be asked through the cycle theory. Meanwhile, there's this kind of weird bit about a civilization's heroic age. That sort of stuff is usual for mystical historians. My challenge is that we've always told romantic stories about heroes. Shakespeare made a career out of telling the story of monarchs who lived 700 years after Charlemagne, and today we have character studies about kings or presidents and movies about superheroes. Those fill the same role as stories about King Arthur or Heracles did in the past. It's a continuation, not a cycle. For the sake of brevity, I'll just summarize what he says next. Christianity is Greek mythology, Northern Europe is the Dorian people, Romantic Europe is the Ionian people, and Jewish merchants are the Phoenician people. Both cities in ancient Rome and kingdoms in medieval Europe had a sense of self-identity and some had republican institutions. Then mystery cults are the Protestant Reformation and at the same time Greek colonies in Italy and Sicily are the later European colonies in the New World. Now, these are cool and interesting parallels to draw, but they don't really make much sense. Medieval Europe didn't really have a sense of self-identity comparable to the civic patriotism of ancient Greek city-states. You'd have to wait until the nationalism of the 1800s or maybe the liberalism of the 1700s for something like that to come along, but that would mess up the cycle theory. Another thing, what if Althist focuses a lot on the role of religion in ancient Greece, saying that religion dominated and permeated every aspect of life, imbibing ritual and God into every action. Ancient Greek polytheistic religion was really different from medieval Christianity though. Polytheism is a syncretic belief system which absorbs other religions, 
whereas monotheism is an exclusionary belief system. As a result, there was no inquisition, no crusades, and no wars of religion in ancient Greece, but those things were fundamental to medieval and renaissance Europe. What if Altist is right when he says religion was important to the people of ancient Greece? But he makes a mistake by saying the Protestant Reformation is a parallel to mystery cults. Mystery cults, unlike previous faiths in Greece, promised to save people from damnation through secret rituals or knowledge. Christianity fundamentally started off as one of these mystery cults, the greatest of them all. But that would mess up the cyclical theory, since it speaks of evolution over time and not parallel cycles. Now, there are other parallels you could just as easily draw between uh, different places and times, but those would mess up Greece being Europe and Rome being America. Now, America is often compared to Rome, but it's also compared back to Greece. Maybe we can compare the ancient Greek city-states to the 13 colonies of America, for example. Those republics fought wars against a powerful outside foe, Persia for the Greeks and Britain for America. Maybe you could even cast Greece as America and the Anatolian Greek colonies as Europe, with Persia being Nazi Germany expanding in and conquering new territory. Next, the Greek city-states clashed in a civil war, with one side representing democratic values, that would be Athens or the Union or maybe NATO, and the other side representing hierarchical values, Sparta or the Confederacy or maybe even the USSR. Another place America is compared to is Zion, the Kingdom of Israel. As the Hebrew Bible recounts, the Israelite people came to dominate Canaan in a genocidal war, then were divided for a while before being united into the Kingdom of Israel. This lasted a few generations until it was split apart into North and South. The parallels between America or Europe are pretty clear. See, these parallels are fun, but they completely mess up the cyclical theory of Spengler since they occur at different times along a civilization's alleged cycle. If I wanted to, I could come up with a completely different, just as legitimate cycle theory to explain those parallels I just talked about. Okay, let's move on. I'll let What If Althist describe it himself. Now we get to both Socrates and Rousseau's era. This is a tipping point that Spengler made a huge point about. It's probably the most decisive era in a civilization's development, this being the move from culture to civilization. Culture is when a society's still young and it's determining what direction it's going to go into, and still has a lot of creativity. Meanwhile, civilization is what happens when it's largely figured out what its philosophy and direction is, and then solidifies and carries that out. This tipping from culture to civilization takes centuries and follows a roughly similar direction in each of the world societies. Okay, this is another bit of weird mystical history that's originally from Spangler. It is true that the Enlightenment was a major moment in European history. Philosophers from that period inspired a large part of how we live and organize ourselves today in the Americas and in Europe and across the world too. But we continue to be in a creative society, with philosophers arguing back and forth over what has meaning and how we should organize ourselves and, you know, how we should formulate logical systems. Culture continues to change. For China, the Greeks, and Indians, their move from culture to civilization started around 500 BC and finally set into its mold around 200 BC. You struggled to find any cultural forms that changed in these civilizations after 200 BC in a real way. If you don't include the massive enforced changes from colonialism that occurred in India and China thousands of years later due to Western attack. Now, there's a little trick in what he just said. Did you catch it? Any changes in India and China since 2000 years ago don't count, since those were forced upon them by colonialism. This is bogus, though. There were many major changes in those societies between the ancient period and colonialism. In India, Hinduism evolved, it changed over time, Buddhism disappeared as religion, and Islam rose. Now, Islam was brought to India by foreign conquerors, but the Indian people themselves converted to the religion willingly, for the most part. Those religions informed how people in Indian society organized themselves. Scholars today also often make the claim that the caste system grew and shrunk and changed over time. It wasn't just cemented in place 2,200 years ago. Both India and China today are also influenced by ideologies which originated in the West, but which have become filtered through domestic circumstance. Maoism is based on Marxism, but it has Chinese characteristics. This isn't something that's irrelevant. This is how societies work. They adapt ideas from each other. If we ignored ideas introduced from other regions, then Christianity doesn't really matter in Europe since it came from the Middle East. But that doesn't make any sense because it does matter. Now, the reason I'm focusing on this is not because this claim in particular is very important to the video, but the mindset is that civilizations are coherent units which go through cycles based upon internal reasoning. 
like trains going around a track or something. Spangler casts societies as biological organisms, so it's got a flavor of social Darwinism to it too. Now, this is of course nonsensical. Civilization is a spectrum, an amorphous network of interaction and communication. The Renaissance in Europe was triggered by the transmutation of classical Greek ideas absorbed by Middle Eastern society back to Italy. This whole video is about Rome and America, so let's take the example of Rome, which is a synthesis of ancient Greece and the Etruscan indigenous population of Italy. Or America, which is a synthesis of a dozen cultures in a new and unique context. There's a lot of civilization uh, between these so-called civilizational blocks that Spangler and other historians of his time period talk about. All right, moving on. The West's civilizational cycle ended thousands of years later, which is why it was so much more creative than Asia's civilizations when it smashed into them in the 16th through 20th centuries, since the West only reached this point starting with the French Revolution 200 years ago. Now, all right, this is not why the West conquered Asia. Philosophical debate, what he means by creativity, doesn't really have much connection with technological innovation, which is why Europe conquered Asia. You can make the argument that what the West philosophically valued in the 1700s and the 1800s, Enlightenment-style rationalism, the scientific method, and so on, allowed it to outcompete the rest of the world. But that's a question of what those ideas are, not when those ideas came to a certain society. And anyways, if a society's point along a civilizational cycle corresponds to its relative strength with another civilization, then why is China catching up to Europe again today? Uh, is China a new civilization? And why is Europe still stronger than Africa, just as it was 400 and 1,000 years ago? Anyways. The tipping point from culture to civilization occurs when a society starts to formulate its logical system. This is since barbarians are close to the earth, and they act as their biology demands, giving them vigor. However, once the elite becomes urban and society needs to manage people rather than fight the natural world, it loses its sense of realness. Again, this really doesn't make much sense. First of all, there's no such thing as vigor in a historical sense. Even in nomadic hunter-gatherers, which are not urban, Elites need to manage societies by settling differences and disputes and distributing resources and responsibilities. They weren't just concerned with wrestling or grappling with nature and their biological instincts. Nomadic peoples also had, and still have, advanced philosophical systems in regards to religion and morality. These changed over time just as our philosophical systems do today, in settled society. But they also had some commonly accepted tenets and truths. Spangler and What If Altist falsely suggest that these commonly accepted truths only come around later with urbanization. That doesn't really make much sense. Okay, I'll sum up the next few parts. What If Altist points out that different societies view different things as logical, when that logic is just what everybody irrationally accepts to be true. I don't want to spend too much time nitpicking these, but yes, different societies hold different common assumptions, that's true. But nothing is absolutely agreed by everybody within a certain civilization. Anyways, though. Spengler said classical civilization was Apollonian and the West is Faustian. The classical world pushed for aesthetic and cultural perfection while the West wants to achieve the most it possibly can. Classical art tries to find perfect proportions, and the West for towering Gothic cathedrals reaching up to heaven. The classical world settled in every geographically perfect Mediterranean climate, while the West launched the insane crusades thousands of miles from home. Thus, fundamentally differing philosophies won out over this whole process. This is also bogus. It's astrology for dusty old historians. Let's go through the details. Gothic cathedrals weren't just concerned with scale, but also mathematical perfection. They required intense engineering and focus, and what you could call perfect proportions. At the same time Gothic cathedrals were being built, we have Renaissance artists depicting the human form as accurately as it had been in a thousand years, basing that upon studies of human anatomy. Michelangelo painted the interior of churches, and other artists did too, so that the local would have spiritual significance through its beauty. People in the West today still care deeply about beauty and perfection, that's why cosmetics is such an immense industry, and why people go to the gym. People often criticize Westerns today for being too focused on the near term, or themselves, and being in bubbles of their own. By Spangler's definition, maybe we're Apollonian, or maybe these labels don't really make much sense. Meanwhile, back in classical Greece, sculptors built immense statues and temples, and they would have built things as large as Gothic cathedrals if they had the ability to do so. Also, the Crusades never went as far as the conquests of Alexander the Great in the classical period. He was driven by an immense longing for greatness and expansion into the unknown, pretty Faustian. Greek city-states didn't purposely build 
their colonies in perfect Mediterranean climates. That was just where they spawned in the first point. If I can make as legitimate of a case for the West today being Apollonian and classical civilization being Faustian, then those terms are just made up and don't reflect reality. And certainly, what if Altist acknowledges that there's nuances, but it's worth challenging the spangler behind it all. Now, not to nitpick, but here's something else that bothers me. He lists some of the contemporary challenges to these ascendant philosophical dogmas. Both of these societies saw declines in religion, growing scale, and massive social problems that had very similar philosophies with ancient Greece having communists, who did sometimes seize political power, nihilist Epicureans, or those who look solely for physical pleasure, materialist status, and all that. Now, I don't want to make a big deal about all of this, but this is an inaccurate description of Epicurean philosophy. Epicureanism is not hedonism. Epicureanism focuses on pleasure in the sense of happiness do whatever makes you happy in the long term. Epicurean philosophers argued that hedonism, looking solely for physical pleasure, would only make you unhappy in the long term. Modesty, sustainability, wisdom, and justice lead to happiness, according to Epicurus himself. And so what's so bad with happiness? Anyways, moving on. However, the biggest social problems were different between these two. In the classical world of Greece and Rome, as befit an aristocratic society, the biggest problem was slavery. Classical civilization practiced slavery on a truly massive level, so much so that they never really used the steam engine or elementary computers, both of which they invented, since slave labor was so cheap. As I've said before in other videos, slavery is one of the worst things a society can ever do for its own development for a bunch of reasons, and slavery is really a social cancer. The aristocratic ideals of their society viewed using science for practical gain as immoral and ungentlemanly, thus holding back classical science and the further development of their civilization. Now, here, what if Althist is accurate in that he says slavery was a negative influence on society? It's obviously a moral evil too, and I buy that it reduced the incentive for technological innovation. But of course, I don't really buy that Greece would have developed the steam engine or elementary computers if not for slavery. What happens throughout history is that societies make strange trinkets whose applications are not appreciated at the time. These innovations are then lost or forgotten about. So this point is right in some respects and kind of wrong in others. Okay, let's fast forward through the next bits. What if Althist says European colonialism is the parallel for Alexander the Great's conquests, with the wars of the Diadochi being kind of like the colonial wars between European empires? This is kind of a thin comparison, but he admits that since he can't find a direct parallel to Alexander the Great himself. As he points out, the West had the Industrial Revolution too, which increased material standard of living, while ancient Greece had Aristotle, a great philosopher. I won't nitpick these points since uh, he himself is pointing out the differences. Next, he says, First, with these bloody internal wars, you saw the breakdown of both Greece and Europe. In both cases, Italy or North America and the Asian former colonies grew at the expense of the old Greek or European heartlands, which declined in economic importance. As the Greeks and Europeans fought each other and lost their vigor, it allowed an anti-colonial native resistance in the African and Asian colonies, or among the Parthians and Jews in the Hellenistic East. You even see a similar political trajectory with monarchies turning to aristocratic democracies. Then with expending the political franchise, you saw and the rise of a welfare state in both Europe and Greece, which then allowed the rise of communist revolutionaries who wanted to divide everything. You saw dictatorships replace democracies in both Europe and Greece, until they both greeted the Europeans and Americans as liberators, which leads us to the next segment. Now, before we get into the bit of America as Rome, I want to address some of the strange claims he just made. Of course, European colonialism was a lot different than Alexander's empire, which was syncretic in nature and lasted only briefly before fragmenting. For the next several hundred years, those areas were led by Greek dynasties, but they were fused into local contexts. So the Hellenistic age wasn't about the domination of Greek culture over others, but the fusion of Greek culture into others. European colonialism doesn't really match with this that well, but he admits this, so alright. Next, he sets this outline that after their climactic civil wars, both Europe and Greece turned from monarchies to aristocratic democracies, then to dictatorships. Sure, it's true that after World War I, dictators rose to power in Europe, with one in particular conquering most of the continent during World War II. But that doesn't really match at all what happened in Greece after Alexander the Great died. Greece was ruled by the Kingdom of Macedon, a kingdom, which stamped out challenges for a century until Rome came in. I'm not sure what he's really talking about with communist revolutionaries either. Maybe he talks about it more in another video, but as far as I can tell, this claim 
makes uh, pretty little sense. All right, on to the next section. Now here we get to the main point of the comparisons between the U.S. and the Roman Republic. Now let's start with the key difference. That the United States is a country of direct European ancestry that was ported abroad, while the Romans were just an ethnic group that was pretty close, all things considered as the Greeks, and part of a roughly similar cultural proximity. However, both America and Rome are nations built off driving out the kings and establishing a republic. The American Republic was consciously modeled off the Roman system, for Christ's sake, which is why it shares institutions like the Senate. The early American Republic tried to learn as many lessons as possible from the Roman system, such as combining an aristocratic and populist branch of the legislature, and America being the Senate and the House, being wary of professional militaries, and lots of checks and balances between different branches of the government to prevent tyranny. This is all true, no criticisms. He goes on to list some other similarities, focusing on a can-do spirit that America has and that Rome had. He also points out that America and Rome both had the ability to absorb disparate cultures into a singular political body. That's also true. Next he says, Both the United States and Rome remained deeply socially conservative and religious in their founding years. America's four founders were often religious fanatics, like the Puritans, Quakers, Cavaliers, and other hard-headed Englishmen, while the founders of Rome were equally stoic and religious. Early America and Rome were both rural, culturally homogenous, incredibly socially conservative. Both had incredibly strong senses of patriotism, more so than almost any other competing nations of their era. Both Rome and America stayed religious for centuries longer than the Greeks and the Romans, and viewed their nations as vehicles for divine plans and themselves as God's chosen people. Now, this is mostly right. There's some nuance that's worth pointing out, though. So by America's four founders, he's talking about the first European settlers in the Americas. It's true that the Puritans and other hardline Protestant groups made up a good chunk of the first settlers to America. They weren't all of them, but a good chunk. But by 1700, the Puritans no longer controlled Massachusetts, and by 1740, they basically dissipated and were absorbed into broader society. It's true that many early Americans saw themselves carrying out God's purpose, but many were also pretty secular, more so than would be accepted today in the United States even. Thomas Jefferson was a deist, for example, who didn't believe Jesus Christ committed miracles. Someone like that wouldn't be elected president today. You can call these uh, sorts of people conservative, but they were also pretty progressive when it came to, you know, establishing a democracy which disagreed with the divine right of monarchs. But classical Romans also got rid of a tyrannical monarchy and established a republic, so yeah, sure. But uh, I wouldn't really call early America culturally homogenous. To the early Americans, differing views on religion, which were very common, were a divide in the American community. This was why the Founding Fathers prohibited the establishment of a singular government religion. There also existed differing ways of life, from the planter aristocrats of Virginia to the wealthy urbanites of Boston and New York. But yeah, sure, early America was a lot more homogenous than America today, that's true. Next, what if Altist draws the inevitable comparison between George Washington and Cincinnatus or Kinkinados, to use the Latin as he does. It's true that both the United States and Rome had a similar sense of civic virtue, emphasizing selflessness and service. Here's another interesting point he makes. A major similarity in the Romans and Americans is that they are good at changing out elites. Ibn Khaldun, one of the greatest historians in world history, said social elites largely became decadent after between 100 to 200 years on average. And Peter Turchin has proven this with modern science. Both America and Rome have been really skilled at shifting elites, thus allowing their empires to be very durable, once the previous elites become decadent, moving to another one. However, for both the Europeans and the Greeks, their empires have largely fallen when their elites become decadent. This is an interesting point, and the graphic he has is also pretty interesting as well. Now, of course, how you exactly define what a ruling class is is pretty complex and kind of fuzzy around the edges, especially for such a large place as America. This theory is inspired a lot by Marxism, which uh, is funny to see in a What If Altist video. This Turchin guy that was born in Khrushchev's USSR. So what if Althist talks about the decadence being the cause of the fall of an elite class, but Turchin argues instead that elite intrafighting because of overpopulation within the elite class is the main cause. And we'll talk about that whole decadence point later on, but Turchin's point is interesting at least. Next, what if Althist goes through some of the differences between Rome and America? The US has never been as threatened by invasion as Rome was. Rome was sacked a dozen times, while Washington DC was sacked once by the Canadians. The U.S. also had a greater technological gap between it and Native Americans than between Rome and, say, the Gallic tribes of France. 
I think he goes a little too far on this point. Native Americans did put up a tough fight, especially in early America. The US couldn't just waltz to California, it had to fight dozens of wars, which really only ended by 1880 or around that period. But yeah, this is mostly true. Next he says, The second key difference being Christianity and Christian values. Christian values enforce a greater degree of respect for human life, which is missing in Rome's mass slavery and destruction of its provinces, while also pushing socially destabilizing forces like racial equity, feminism, and the like. The Romans, in many ways, were what America would be like if it was just the Confederate states, a predominantly agrarian-based slave economy run by an aristocracy that would probably try to conquer Mexico and the Caribbean to turn them into serfs. The American and Western worlds have really dodged a bullet by not facing the horrifying social consequences of slavery, which have largely been diffused by Christian morality. I certainly buy this point too. The abolitionists of the second half of the 1800s were deeply influenced by Christianity. So too were the Confederates though, which kind of complicates things. But it's also important to point out that slavery was a major part of the US economy for a long time. And I'll be charitable about the social stability point. Things like racial equity and feminism are good things which serve to disrupt cruel social hierarchies. So social instability can be a moral positive too. Next he says, America has also treated its subject peoples much better than the Romans, probably the best of any major empire ever. Just compare Carthage to Germany or Japan, where the Romans committed genocide against a peaceful country for revenge, while the US let Germany and Japan prosper under their local governments. The Romans constantly extorted and muddled in their subject nation's politics, while the US never really does it with its dependent countries. Now, it's true, I would agree, that classical Rome was a lot more cruel than the United States. If Caesar was alive today, we would have drone bombed him for crimes against humanity. But we can't just brush over all the cruel aspects of the American Empire. The massive Native American population of North America mostly decreased through diseases, but those who remained were mostly killed off by colonists and soldiers over the course of 300 years. Same too with the Philippines, where US soldiers murdered many peaceful people and Vietnam, where we poisoned generations of civilians with Agent Orange, and a lot of other places too. It's true that the US didn't kill all of Germany or Japan, but we did bomb them to bits. So if Rome was in our shoes, they would have done worse things, but we did some pretty bad things too, alright? Now, I don't want to get into a whole argument about the morality of total war, just looking at the stats here. Also, he makes a weird point about us not interfering in our subject nation's politics. That's completely bogus. MacArthur, a US admiral, wrote the Constitution of Japan. We spent billions of dollars interfering in the politics of Latin America for 80 years. We've invaded a lot of countries too, uh, so I don't really buy that point. Next, he makes a claim that the United States hasn't really profited off of creating an empire, while Rome profited off of its empire. This point only makes sense if we count America as the whole continental United States, but America originated 200 years before we united the whole continent, uh, over the course of generations, it created a continental empire. That expansion was very profitable. Next section. In their early centuries, the Americans and Romans filled in their core sea to shining sea territories, or Italy and the North American continent, largely fighting non-state tribal peoples and building alliances of co-ethnics in doing so. Thus, with both the two Punic and World Wars, they rose from local dominance to becoming the most powerful nation in the world, mostly unwittingly as a reluctant superpower. A minor atrocity caused in a mess of small states in the center of the geopolitical map, in Sicily and the Balkans, caused the First War which escalated through a series of alliances, resulting in the Americans and Romans winning the war, but largely through winging it. However, the harsh terms of the treaty left the losing faction, the Carthaginians and Germans, bitter all right, first, a minor atrocity didn't start the First Punic War. The Carthaginian occupation of Messina did. I guess you could call Franz Ferdinand getting shot an atrocity, but, uh, all right. Anyways, World War I and the First Punic War are really only similar in that they're both wars. Great powers uh, fight wars for a variety of reasons, but probably the most common is clashing geopolitical interests. Rome and Carthage both had an interest in Sicily, just as Russia and Austria had an interest in Serbia. And to take a, another random example, America and Mexico had an interest in Texas. The US joined the First World War at the end, which doesn't really have a parallel in the case of the Punic War. At the end of that war, the Punic War, 
Rome annexed most of Sicily, which also doesn't really have a comparison to World War I. But it's true that Carthage was pissed off by the peace treaty, that's, that's true. Alright, on to the Second War. Then resulting in a militaristic, de facto dictator starting a war over a new territory to create living space elsewhere for their nation, being Spain or Poland, spiraling into the bloodiest war in history up to that point, being the Second Punic Wars or World War II. After mobilizing their insane population and economic power, the Americans and Romans were able to defeat the better generalship of the Romans and Carthaginians, ending in them eviscerating the enemy cities, as seen in Carthage as well as Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Alright, so what if Althist next points out a key difference between the Second Punic War and the Second World War? Rome was devastated, but America was not. On the other hand, both the US and Rome had to fight a two-front war, he points out. But these comparisons kind of fall flat, right? Sure, it's a great power war, but besides that, the semblances are kind of surface level. Here's an idea. Alright, here's an idea. Wouldn't it make sense for Russia being the Rome of World War II? Just like Russia, Rome expanded across vast land before being challenged by a rival great power for control over a neighboring territory. Sicily for Rome and the Balkans for Russia. Russia didn't do too well in the First World War, that's true, but it came back strong for the Second World War. Carthage, we can say that's Germany, uh, invaded Rome and occupied it, killing many, but was ultimately pushed out, with Rome getting Spain, kind of like Russia getting Eastern Europe. There's not really a neat comparison for the Third Punic War in this case, but there isn't either if we're counting America as Rome. Now again, these comparisons are fun, but they don't really make much sense if you think too much about them. It's not really a big deal, but there's this Spenglerian theory of history behind it, which is the actual kind of crazy thing. Next. The American entrance into Europe is incredibly similar to the Romans' entrance into Greece. The Romans viewed the democratic, coastal southern Greeks as cultural cousins who had to be protected against the savage authoritarian Macedonians and Seleucids, who are almost a stand-in for America protecting Western Europe against the Germans and Soviets. The Americans didn't want to colonize Europe and the Romans Greece, but put military influence in there to protect them from tyranny, creating the Achaean League as an alliance against the Macedonians, kind of like NATO and the European Union against the Soviets. There were three Macedonian wars in which the Romans took progressively more control over Greece, kind of like the First and Second World Wars alongside the Cold War. Alright, this is an interesting comparison. But of course, what actually happened is a lot more complex. The First Macedonian War, which was fought during the Second Punic War, that's going to be like World War II, did not result in Rome occupying all of Greece. It was a stalemate. But sure, shortly after the Second Punic War, you have the Second Macedonian War, in which Rome got its first foothold in Greece. Then 30 years later, that would be about 1980 if we're going with the parallels, Rome beat Macedonia. 20 years after that, you have the Fourth Macedonian War, in which Rome finally annexed Macedonia. So there's some parallels, but that's just kind of how history works, right? Empires gradually expand, and this is the gradual expansion of an empire. Macedonia doesn't really function as a good stand-in for the Soviet Union, since the US hasn't conquered and annexed Russia, just as it hasn't annexed Europe, really. These parallels can be drawn between the US and Rome, or they can be drawn between any expanding empire, really. But just because you can draw these parallels doesn't mean that they define history. Some empires have expanded a little bit, then collapsed. Next, what if Altist points out that America and Rome had similar motivations? They were both driven by what drives all imperial republics. Uh, the ideal of expanding freedom, democracy, and so on, even if that ideal doesn't really play out in the real world. This is a good parallel to draw, yeah. He also points out that the annexation of Greece into Rome tightened cultural connections between the two. But next he says, the Romans, after these victories, had what they called an era of gold, or after the Punic Wars, their era of vast wealth, in which they lost their religion and traditional values alongside seeing the collapse of their society. This is the equivalent of the West baby boomer generation, which, as I've explained in this video, has seen the collapse of the West traditional moral structure as the post-war era was so wealthy. This era saw the collapse in birth rate, rise in sexual deviancy, skyrocketing inequality, and the like, similarly to the West's history since World War II. Orgies and sexual openness was no longer scorned. Feminism gained massive traction as women gained total legal equality, except for the vote. The divorce rate skyrocketed as well, and divorces became a normal thing. You even saw an equivalent to transgenderism, with some young slave boys cutting off their genitals and dressing as women for their master's pleasure. Alright, this is bogus. This meme has been around for a long time, that Rome grew decadent, 
and culturally corrupt after gaining an empire. It's so pervasive that you can even find it in the Watergate tapes. Here's what Nixon said. I mean, come on. Homosexuality was common throughout Rome before Rome conquered Greece. There wasn't an issue with it. Homophobia came around later with Christianity. And so about this weird transgender take. In the Roman Republic, you had the Galli priesthood, in which eunuchs would dress as women, but throughout Roman history, transgender people were a tiny minority and not a big issue, just as today. Roman society did not become sexually deviant with the acquisition of an empire. That's just not how it works. There are some records that talk about the things What If Altist mentions, trans people, but those historical sources were written by contemporary Romans who didn't like those things, showing that society as a whole did not become sexually deviant or whatever. A lot of those sources also focus on emperors, that's where this information is coming from, that the historians didn't like. Roman historians had political agendas. They cast those they didn't like as deviants or perverts or whatever. Did Roman emperors really do all sorts of indulgent and messed up things? Sure, I bet they did, but that wasn't a sign that society as a whole was losing any sense of value, rather that giving absolute power to a monarch was a bad idea. That absolute power and the corruption of democratic institutions, that's the actually worrisome thing. Not whether an emperor cheated on his wife, or whether more women were getting divorced. Also, about that woman point. So, I don't know what source he's relying on that says women gained more rights after the conquest of Greece. That might have been the case, it might not have been, but Roman women were respected as valuable parts of society throughout Roman history, but were never really given any power. Divorce might have gone up around 200 BC, but we can't know that for sure because Rome didn't keep records of divorces. We really only have the example of the elites of Roman society to go on, and they probably weren't representative of Roman society as a whole. But applying this idea that divorces in Rome tore apart traditional values is a modern construction. Families in ancient Rome were a lot different than families today, and it's really impossible to know whether divorce was such a negative thing that was so pervasive and corrupting in classical Rome. Moving on. In both cases, inequality rose to dazzling heights as the benefits of empire were spread disproportionately. Large corporations gained larger and larger portions of the economy, and the wages of normal Romans were undercut by slave labor brought in from the empire, sort of like how we offshore businesses to Malaysia, China, or Mexico today, which in both societies crushed the previous middle classes, which then moved into cities and became a largely disassociated proletariat with no stake in society, who voted for populists and relied upon the welfare state which ballooned. Immigrants, largely slaves, flooded into Italy, in 100 BC being a third of the population, roughly equal to that of the foreign-born and their children in America today. I think this is a good point. As societies gain wealth, they need proper systems in place so that that wealth doesn't just go to the top. We see the same issue across the world today. As a whole, people across the world, societies, they're growing richer. But those gains are not distributed equally among the population. Rome had its wealthy oligarchs who owned vast estates. We have billionaire CEOs today. From these metrics, we should roughly be in 120 BC today, as the Republic is decaying. I think a roughly good place to position ourselves is around the Gracchi brothers being Trump. The Gracchis were extremely wealthy populace bent on redistributing land and improving the station of the old Roman middle class that had been severely weakened by globalization and cheap foreign labor, and they were hated by entrenched elites. The Gracchis were assassinated, which didn't happen to Trump, but he definitely was invalidated by the establishment. A continuous theme here is the American events are less bloody than the Roman, and so this parallel makes sense. Now. I'm not going to argue that we're not in an unstable time in American politics, but this is an example where these parallels obfuscate more than they reveal. Donald Trump did not redistribute wealth in a meaningful way. In fact, he campaigned against the sort of redistribution promoted by people on the left, like Bernie Sanders. It's true that the middle class voted more for Trump than Clinton, but so too did the upper class. Meanwhile, if you look to 2020, Joe Biden won by getting a hold of the middle class, while Trump was left only with the upper class. So Trump is no Gracchi, this parallel doesn't make much sense. We would need some sort of socialist revolutionary, right? Alright, what does he say next? At this point, I'm just going to say what happened after this point in Roman history and see what a similar comparison would be in America. And I'm just going to run with a scenario of Rome being the future of America. 
From this point in Roman politics for the next 80 years, you saw political assassinations common and the two political parties, the optimares and populares, not accepting the other's right to power. As the political system of compromise broke down, military dictators and strongmen like Sulla and Marius seized power, purging Roman politics of their opponents. Eventually, a conservative dictator stabilized Rome a hundred years after where we are now in the comparison. Rome stopped being a democracy at all, really, with Augustus maintaining the outward forms of a democracy. But then for his descendants, as even the memory of Rome being a democracy vanished, they became fully dictatorial and made fun of all of the former vestiges and ceremonial parts of the democracy that still were around. This would be the equivalent of each party not recognizing the other and America falling to different dictatorships, with the populares, whose closest parallel is the Democrat Party, spawning warlords who fight over the dying American Republic as they offer the public all kinds of welfare goodies for supporting them. Now, I'm not going to critique this point so much since he acknowledges he's making a future prediction. I do think important things we have to watch out for today in the United States are partisan divide, and the expansion of the power of the president. That's true. Roman institutions crumbled for similar reasons, leading to the end of the Republic and the rise of the Empire. Here's what he says next. The Romans then had a series of horrifying slave rebellions that they bloodily put down. America doesn't really have a close equivalent, maybe Mexican migrant labor, but their kids naturalized and become Americans. And if we over-mechanize the economy so no one can work, maybe a Luddite rebellion against the machines and AI doing all the work. Rome's allied Italian republics rebelled as well, killing hundreds of thousands, which really doesn't have a good equivalent at all since America's states have equal political power, while Rome bossed its Italian subject states around. There was also an invasion of German barbarians into Italy, which also really has no good parallel since the Brazilians aren't going to be attacking Texas anytime soon. Maybe Mexico industrializes and becomes a threat in the next 50 years? I think What If Altist is pretty accurate when he says that there's not a neat comparison between the, the social war between Rome and its tributary Italian allies and modern-day America. But we could definitely imagine today that disaffected and impoverished people across the country, whether in crumbling urban areas or neglected rural ones, could form the core of a resistance movement against the federal government in a century. All you need to do would be to politicize gangs and cities and give the militias in rural areas a good reason to start using the guns they have against the government. If we want to continue the theme of the problems of classical civilization stemming from slavery and the West from having technological progress too fast, instead of all these issues of social unfairness, America might instead see crises due to collapse social traditions, such as birth rates not being able to stay constant and society having serious problems from that, or gender issues or young men rebelling against social justice and all that sort. Obviously, these are future predictions, so I'm not going to be so critical, but to me, it seems more likely that the centralization of wealth and political power in the hands of an aristocratic elite, which is happening today in America, is more of a risk to societal stability than, I don't know, social justice or whatever. The danger of declining birth rates is also maybe overhyped, especially for countries like the US, which can count on immigration from neighboring societies. All right, what next? Some nation in Eastern Europe, like Germany or Russia, launches a rebellion against NATO in the next few decades. This is a proxy for the North Anatolian Mithridates from Pontus, who launched a rebellion that briefly drove the Romans out of the Greek world, of the Balkans and Turkey, before being defeated. This seems pretty plausible to me. The Romans kept conquering for the next century and more, taking North Africa, Gaul, or modern France, and the Eastern Mediterranean, and finally taking Egypt. This is a place where it's again difficult to compare, since all of Rome's conquests made geographic sense since they were clustered around the Mediterranean. There's no similar position for the US, which already controls 75% of the world's economy in its sphere of influence and thus can either conquer horribly poor areas like Africa that have no value, or giant overpopulated Asian countries like India or China that are difficult to manage and also don't have a lot of value. I guess Central America and Southeast Asia are areas that it would make sort of sense for America to conquer? First, I think the point about Russia being a stand-in for Pontus makes sense. Or maybe even an anti-American wave in Europe. This is the future we're talking about, so weird things can happen. But in any case, there's plenty of good places for the United States to conquer if we as a country went full-fledged fascist. We do have a lot of trade across the world, 
but a fascist government wouldn't see trade as a benefit. It would want to control resources at their extraction point to use them for the benefit of the core society. So what places would be on the menu? First, obviously, is Canada. Then we have Latin America and the Caribbean. The people who inhabit those places aren't as wealthy as Americans, that's true, but the countries themselves are resource rich, with Venezuela having massive untapped oil reserves, for example. Beyond that, I can imagine a fascist US government launching crusades in the Middle East or Africa in order to put puppet regimes or even corporations in charge of resource extraction. All right, what's next? However, once you try to use it to look into the future, it gets much more difficult since we don't know what's going to happen in the future at all. When we try to project the future from strictly following the historic pattern, it's hard. However, from our past, it seems plausible, though, that we'll follow a path pretty similar to the Romans, although its actual practical details will be difficult to predict. Now, I want to make two points about this. First, if the cycle theory can't be projected into the future, then maybe it's just a way to arbitrarily and meaninglessly organize events of the past. For example, you could come up with a mathematical formula to explain the course of every previous election in the United States. But this pattern doesn't actually reveal anything if you don't test it by seeing if it explains the next election before you know what happens. The same thing is in play here. Spangler's theory tries to explain the course of civilizations as a whole, but his prediction that the West would fall to Caesars, for example, just hasn't played out. We beat those Caesars in World War II. It's been a hundred years since he made those predictions, and it's true that the US isn't doing its best, but who knows how the future will go. The theory also has to accurately explain the past events in the first place, and Spangler's theory doesn't do that. Next, what if Altist points out that the president has been growing in power in the US, and that conceivably we could have a military dictatorship in the future? I agree with both of those points full-heartedly. To end, what can we do to prevent this Roman path which involves us losing our freedoms? Here are a couple of my guesses from the Roman precedent. The first will be to respect the value of labor. The Romans pushing slavery was one of the top things that killed their society. America doesn't practice slavery, but it does many other similar things that crush the value of the American worker, whether AI, automation, offshoring, and the like, which crush American wages in the exact same way Gallic or Syrian slaves used to do so. I think this point is completely valid. Today in the United States, productivity growth has far outpaced wage growth since the 1980s. We're being paid less for more work. Maybe that's the big reason why we're seeing such anger in the country today. A good way to reduce the tensions we have is to make sure that people can be happy in their lives through having better paying and more fulfilling work. The risk of AI automation and offshoring are also major risks, which also play a key role in this whole thing. Next he says, Secondly, to stick to our traditional American values like freedom, truth, sexual propriety, and all that. The Romans were initially a very honorable and moral people, and then as they became wealthy, shoved all their values down the toilet. By the time you get the reigns of tyrants like Caligula or Nero, the Romans really believed in nothing. Values may feel like they don't exist, but in fact there are barriers against the arbitrary whims of rulers, since you have a shared conception about what your society will stand for. I find it worrying traditional American values like freedom, the truth, responsibility, and individualism seem to never be discussed anymore in popular culture. When I was a child, I heard about freedom and the truth all the time. Now they'll never be mentioned, and instead society focuses on woke stuff. Alright, first I think this point is mostly correct, minus the complaint about woke stuff. Liberal norms and values play an important role in preventing the government from suppressing its people. Ever since 9-11, we've seen a massively growing security state which can use vague threats to suppress people, threatening to replace liberalism with something worse. Hopefully, as we grow farther from 9-11, this fades away, but who knows. But I also think one key point he makes is complete bogus. The disappearance of sexual propriety, whatever that means, played zero role in why Rome as a society became authoritarian. Caligula and Nero and other emperors weren't bad because they were promiscuous or whatever, they were bad because they were cruel tyrants. Tyranny is bound by the other norms and values he mentions. Honor, truth, responsibility, individualism, as well as a strong legal system. But those things are still talked about on TV and in culture in America today, despite what he says. People argue about what those liberal values mean and how they apply to the world today, not that those values aren't good unless you're hyperfixating on neo-Nazis or Stalinists or whatever. 
the quote-unquote woke stuff is just another form of liberalism, which emphasizes the right to identify as who you want and associate with who you wish, which is pretty run-of-the-mill liberalism. Next. The third thing would be respect for civilian power rather than defaulting upon military dictatorship like the Romans did. The Roman elite and political class became so morally corrupt that the only functioning organization that still existed was the army. Looking at our political parties and the cultural elite, I worry at the same thing for modern America, where a military dictatorship may look like a more and more reasonable option every day. I think this is a great point. People today highly distrust the people in power, whether that means Congress, the Supreme Court, or the President, and it seems to be getting worse as time goes on. The national organization which has the most trust in the United States today is the U.S. military. Now, of course, it's going to take a major cultural change in the U.S. military to take control of the U.S., uh, since the military views itself as divorced from politics, but that culture can change, especially if we enter a national crisis like Rome did. All right, here are his closing words. The thing is that there were conservatives at the time of the decline of the Roman Republic who said the exact same things I've said here. Men like Cicero and Cato, who were totally correct and saw the direction things were going, who did not want to see their world fall to slavery and despotism. However, they were screaming into a lost cause. As Samuel Francis said about recent conservatism, beautiful losers. The difference between us and them is that the future still lies ahead of us to create. Let's prove that you can learn something from history. I think that's a good note to close off the video with. I think there are certainly lessons we can take from Rome on how to avoid democratic backsliding and the replacement of liberalism with tyranny. We need to strengthen our institutions in this country so that charismatic leaders, the coming Sullas and Caesars, are restricted by the will of the people. We as a country would benefit from more binding popular referendums, more open primaries, and if we've got a wish list going, the dismantling of these two major power centers which control everything that happens in politics. But we also can't afford to chain ourselves to those institutions that we have in this country which are crumbling and sinking us into the ocean. Reform is necessary in a lot of places. One thing I'd argue, and I'm sure people would disagree with me, and some might even agree with me, is that the President of the United States has too much political power. Every four years is now a national crisis, and I only see that getting worse. If the President didn't have the power to make or break this country, or other countries, then that national crisis also wouldn't exist. But we also need to make sure that our legislature is able to function and do its job Right now, the filibuster makes it so that you need 60 senators to get anything done in the country. That means nothing important gets done when it needs to. The same thing happened to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, where a single prince could veto away a major proposal, and that's why there's no longer any Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. We also need to make sure our economy works for everyone. We've grown rich over the past century, but increasingly those gains are in the hands of a small elite and not the broader American populace. That's the perfect recipe for disaster. I don't think America is doomed to destruction, just like Rome, we're too big to die out. But I do think we have to watch out for challenges to our democracy in the coming years. History doesn't repeat, it doesn't cycle, but it does sometimes rhyme. If you listen to the song, you'll know how to answer the lyrics. All right, thanks for watching this pretty lengthy video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like and subscribe.